Well, good morning. Bon dia. Bon dia. Great to see you here this morning. Your smiling faces. We come to worship the Lord together and to celebrate Him. Let me read to you our call to worship this morning is found in Revelations chapter 21. It says, I, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people. <coughs> and God himself will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things will pass away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. God, the creator of the universe, offers us life this morning. Let's pray and invite his presence here. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to come into your presence, O oh God. And we pray that all that we would do would glorify you. We invite you to come, Lord. God, we want to drink from your living well this morning. Speak to us, Lord. Come and be glorified, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll invite you to stand. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's sing in honor, glory and power, be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days.
Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Two announcements for you this morning. One is following the service um, is our time for elections of new church leaders. So if you are a member of this church, you are um, encouraged to vote. And that will be um, to my left over here, your right. Uh, in the uh, chapel there, and it will only take you a moment. Uh, but so if you're a member of the church, please, uh, after church, head in that direction, and uh, we'll take care of that uh, election for you. And then <clears throat> we've been contacted by um, the uh, Good Neighbors Food Pantry, which is um, just at the, housed in the church over here, Newman Church to my uh, left. And on uh, May 11th, they will be receiving um, a large shipment donations um, from uh, basically the letter carriers. Any of you know the letter carriers that have a time when people donate um, uh, and uh, they're going to be receiving a shipment on May 11th from the letter carriers, and they're looking for help um, to do that, to um, unload uh, and take it into the church and sort it and put it away and, and get them all ready for, uh, uh, for those that come on Tuesdays. So if you're interested in that, um, you, it is on May 11th from, well, the first shift is from 1 to 3 and then 3 to 5. And if you need more information, um, Leisha is actually our contact there. Um, so you can see her, but um, 
If you desire to be a part of that, um, to help out our community feed those who are in need, and that is on May 11th. Well, let's invite our ushers to come forward. Let's receive our offering this morning as we worship to give to God in offering to him in recognition that all that we are is a gift that he gives to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give this morning. It is our joy, it is our worship, Lord, to offer these gifts to you. And I ask you to bless those who give this morning, encourage and minister to them. And Lord, take these gifts and use them for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In the Church of the Nazarene, we pray for the mighty power of Christ to be in us and be with us as we seek to do His will. We are a church that prays. The apostles, Paul and Timothy, show us how to pray for our church as they prayed for the church in Colossae. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Our prayer for one another in the Church of the Nazarene is the same, to please the Lord in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, strengthened by His glorious might. A half million Nazarenes in the USA and Canada region pray together from Easter to Pentecost. 2024 is our third year praying together in unity for the days ahead. The Spirit has given us His vision for our churches in Canada and the United States. Our vision is represented by the cycle of resurgence, and 2024 is the year we'll focus on blessing our community. That means getting out from within the walls of the church going into the community, and being a blessing to our neighbors. Pursuing this vision begins in prayer. We'll pray for the Spirit to lead us. We'll pray for our neighbors to be blessed and to have an encounter with God as we serve Him. Will you join your Nazarene brothers and sisters again this year to pray? Please stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
is alive. He is alive. God loves us so. See, He is His hands, His feet, His Yes, we Children are dismissed at this time for their program downstairs. And as we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, the Bible says God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. 
The altar will be open as we sing. If you desire to come and seek the Lord, and let's look to him in prayer this morning, for he is our source. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase to us. begin to pray this morning, would you just, right where you are, lift up thanks to God. Would you thank him for something? Just celebrate him for a moment.
right now, would you lift your own need to the Lord? He invites you to come. And he wants to carry your burden. Tell him this morning. Now would you pray that God would help us to bless our community, open up our eyes to needs, that we would be Jesus to our community. Each one, as they pour their hearts out to you, oh God, would you meet their need? Would you come and bring healing, strength? Would you guide, Lord? God, would you bring peace and comfort? Lord, would you surround them with your care, strengthen? Lord, we're they don't have the answers, we pray that you would just show the way. As they pour their hearts out to you, God, come close, we ask. Minister, do what only you can. Lord, we pray for our world today, so much turmoil. God, we need you. We need a fresh outpouring of your precious Holy Spirit. Revive your church, Lord. Raise us up. And Lord, as we open up your word now, teach us, show us, guide us. Father, we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. And God, in everything, in prayers that you have answered, prayers that you are going to answer, we give you praise. God, you are good and gracious and we thank you in Jesus name Amen Well, in social media, and we are a culture that is driven by social media these days, aren't we? Everyone has an opinion about how and where for you to invest your money. How and where you should do things, right? Everyone ever go to like Facebook and you see the somebody talking about something and say, oh, I've been doing it wrong all along, right? So many opinions out there, aren't there, about it. And, and then I'm also constantly told about uh, what I need to buy, right? Did you ever notice that? We even get calls here at the church and people saying, your church needs this, right? <laughs> Everybody has an opinion. 
And to me, I don't know about you, but to me, what, uh, when I look at the opinions of others, one of the first questions I want to know, or one of the things that gives it le- legitimacy, is when they are involved, or when they have bought the product, or right? For if they're just the seller, then... Or if they're just, well, they have an opinion about how I should live, but they're not living that way, then we don't necessarily take their advice. Do they believe it enough to risk something of their own? What we're talking about is the phrase skin in the game. You ever heard that? Do they have skin in the game? And when you, when you look at the, you do a quick search on Google about what skin in the game means, it comes actually from horse racing. A horse owner has skin in the game, literally the horse's skin. They're, they own the horse, and he is absolutely, totally committed or involved. It's their own property. And uh, whenever their horse is in a race, they literally are in it. During that particular race, the owner of the horse is personally invested in the race. From that example, (coughs) there was a a billionaire, uh, Warren Buffett, reportedly picked up on that phrase and, and kind of changed it a little bit, and when he was talking about investments, he says, put your money where your mouth is, right? Put your money where your mouth is. And and do you want to thank Ed for the his younger picture of himself? <laughs> I, I don't know if the money's still in his mouth, but I can't. <laughs> right? Put your money where your mouth is. Don't just talk. Get in on it. Get in on it. I want this morning to go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. We've been working on that story the past few weeks. And (coughs) Jesus talked about someone who had skin in the game, right? Investing themselves in the effort to show love for a neighbor, and in that story, a, uh, <coughs> a man was walking around the road, Jericho, right? It led from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he, he was jumped, he was beaten by a gang of robbers who took all of his possessions, including his clothes, right? We talked a little bit about that last week. And the beating was so severe it, that it left the victim the Bible says, half dead. He's probably unconscious there, bleeding. (coughs) And fortunately, it's a busy road, and the first person that passes by is a priest, right? Who saw the victim. Now, surely a religious man would help the victim, right? As part of his calling from God. But instead, he moves to the other side of the road. Right? and keeps walking. And I'm sure he probably thought, well, I hope someone helps that poor man. Now, I don't want you to tell me, okay? I don't want you to volunteer the information, but I wonder how many of us at times have seen something and said, oh, I hope somebody helps. <laughs> The second witness was also a religious man. He was a Levite. And he was accustomed to serving and helping. So he was likely to get involved. But the Levite also crossed to the opposite side of the road and and walked on. And maybe he was thinking, I will send somebody back to help when I finish my journey. When I get the chance, I'll send somebody to go help. You see... Neither the priest nor the Levite put any skin in the game. They didn't personally 
invest themselves. Then there was a third witness, and it was the most unlikely to get involved. If, if you all were kind of predicting the story <coughs> back when Jesus was telling it, this was the most unlikely person to get involved. Jesus, was, he was a Samaritan, Jesus said, and the victim was Jewish, and, and the two did not mix. And the Samaritan didn't have a lot of money. You see, Jews and Samaritans were enemies. So talk about a guy that should have walked on the other side of the road. <coughs> but the difference between the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan uh, was the Samaritan had compassion. He took action. He had skin in the game. He went beyond his religious prejudice and his cultural training and he helped. We're in Luke chapter 10 and verse 33 this morning. Luke chapter 10 and verse 33. But the Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. So the first thing we need to see is move in putting skin in the game. <coughs> Excuse me. The first move, let's try that, in putting skin in the game was stopping and moving toward the victim. Stopping and moving toward the victim. The Samaritan interrupted his plans, his direction, and moved to where the victim was. He got down off his animal, came close enough to see exactly what had happened and what was needed. Today, many times, we're, we're kind of used to holding back, thinking someone else will probably be better equipped to take care of the need. There's got to be someone else out there who can better do it. But the Samaritan was the only person there at that moment. You know, over the years, as, uh, as a pastor, I've had many people come and tell me, um, we should be ministering to this group or that group, or, or we should have a particular ministry. We should be having an emphasis on, on this. And, but when I ask them how they want to get involved with it, they say, oh, that's not for me. Or, I've done my time. I've done my part. Let someone else take care of that. Or, you do it, pastor. You see, that response, there's no skin in the game. Right? And they don't look too good. No skin in the game. Church, if God has given you a burden for something, if he's given you eyes to see a need, guess what? He's calling you to get near. The Samaritan moved toward the man. If God's given you a burden in your heart, if God shows you something, God wants you to get near it. He wants you to go to it. Get involved. Notice that, that the Samaritan did not expect or wait for the victim to ask for help. In fact, it was impossible. He was unconscious. But you know, as soon as he asks for help, I'll come and run in. Right? Some people 
you and I will encounter cannot respond. Some may be too embarrassed to admit their need or ask for help. Some people are fearful of being judged because it happened before, right? You know what? Ideas without action is useless. It doesn't do anything. We can all sit here and think about all the good stuff we could possibly do, but if we don't move, it's useless. That's why it's important to move toward the need. Love moves. Love reaches. Love seeks to help. I don't think it's an accident when Jesus was telling the story that he said the priest went over to the opposite side of the road. And the Levite, he went over to the opposite side of the road. I don't think it was an accident. Why? Because we tend to think the further we are from the need, the more we don't have to do anything. Right? The Samaritan moved toward the man. Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... We didn't ask for it. We couldn't ask for it. Christ died for us. Some people think that ministry occurs by us sitting here and setting a time and a location, right? For all needy people to come to church for help. This Thursday night, everyone who needs encouragement, please come to the church at 7 o'clock and we'll encourage you. How many discouraged people do you think would show up on Thursday night at 7 (laughs) o'clock? We need to move toward the need. Blessing our community starts with us actually going to our community. The Samaritan relocated himself and went to the needy person. Real ministry means we put skin in the game. In John... Gospel chapter 1, we see the most amazing demonstration of this, the most amazing demonstration of God's love. And I want to read it from uh, the message because it says this, the word God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Aren't you glad? God came to us because we couldn't go to him. God moved into the neighborhood. He came. He came. When God reveals to you a need, step one is moving toward the need to help. Putting some skin in the game. Well, the next move is to look for wounds we can help. Look for wounds that we can help with, that we can Once the Samaritan was close enough, he could see exactly where the wounds were located, right? So he could know where to bandage them, where to stop the bleeding, right? In medical terms, this is called triage, right? Triage means to assess the urgency of the various needs and what is required for treatment. This is also the place where we take inventory of what God has given to us. What we can use. Yeah, because simply put, if we say, tomorrow I'm going to solve world hunger. Well, no, not really, you're not. You You don't have the means. But can you bring a meal to someone who's going through a tough time? Yeah, you can do that. And you may say, but, but that's puny compared to the need. But church, we sing it all the time. Little is much when God is in it. Right? God's not asking you to do something you can't. God's blessing you and saying, just use what you have, right? And let God multiply it. 
It's, it's like the boy with his lunch, the five loaves and two fish, right? That's not going to feed thousands. Oh, it would if we just say, God, you gave it to me. Here it is. You use it, God. You can do this, God, right? The next question to ask when God brings a need to your attention is not, should I act? The question should be, what can I do with what God has given to me? Do you know what? We are blessed to be a blessing. I've said it before. We are conduits. We are rivers. We're not stale ponds. Nobody, when you came in this morning, did I look at you and say, you look like a stale pond, right? <laughs> We're blessed to be a blessing, to reach out, to touch. And the type of bandaging depends on the type of wound. Sometimes it's a matter of something temporary to ease the pain or, or to, to stop the bleeding until professionals can get help down the road. It is figuring out what the need is and then asking, why has God placed you there? Because there's a reason. God does nothing by accident. Well, number three, we then need to apply medicines as needed. We need to apply medicine as needed. Verse 34 shows that the Samaritan taking further medical steps to heal the wounds by pouring oil and wine on them. Oil and wine were antibacterial medicines used for wound care at that time. But there's something else. There's a spiritual implications here in that story to those two physical liquids. Oil is symbolic of of the pouring on of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And wine is a symbol of the, the new covenant, right? We talk about that when we have communion. Wine is a symbol of the new covenant by which sins are forgiven, by which we receive life and wholeness. And I've said it to you many times before, we carry the presence of God. To our world. We carry the presence of God to our world. So it's okay when an opportunity presents itself to share God, to share his transforming power with others. Tell your story. Talk about why you're helping because you want to share the love of Jesus. Offer to pray for an individual. Do you know statistics say that just a close to 90% of people will accept your prayer? Pray for people. Because God's power is greater than anything else that we have, right? Now, don't cram Jesus down their throat, okay? Man, you're sitting there, you're lying by the side of the road, you're bleeding, you're unconscious. Let me share with you Jesus. You must accept Jesus, then we'll talk about your wounds. No, don't do that. And thank you, Marcos. That's Marcos, by the way. (laughs) Don't cram Jesus down their throat. Just love them. Help them. Pray for them. Talk about how Jesus is important to you. Don't make your help conditional upon whether they will come to church or not on Sunday. Do you know over the years in in organizing various things to, to, to touch our community, to serve. I've had many, many, many people say, but if we do this, will they come on Sunday? No, no, no. We're not called 
to fill this place. That's God's job. We're called to serve. We're called to love. And let God take care of speaking to them about coming to church. Now, you can invite them to church. I hope you'll invite them to church. But don't make the help conditional, right? The world already thinks that all of Christianity, Christians are just out there to get something, right? Not give something. We need to understand that. Offer help. Share Jesus if the opportunity arises. Because you know what? Here's a phrase, a very common phrase that I've kind of twisted a little bit. People need to know how much we care before they can care about who we know. Right? A person lying on the side of the road in need is not going to care if you know Jesus or not first. They're going to care if you care about them, if you love them. And then share Jesus with them. I mean, you, you, you can and you should offer, offer to pray, offer to, you know, tell them about Jesus, but don't push. Don't be a religious freak. Right? Jesus just walked around ministering, healing, helping, and introducing people to the kingdom. But he never forced anybody. Right? It's important to respect people. People want to know you care. When someone does consent to be prayed for, oh, what a powerful opportunity, right? When I was uh, a uh, intern chaplain at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, I went into the room of this man. He was a Jewish man once, and we talked for a while, encouraged him, and then in the end, he said, and, and uh, I'll be praying for you. And he got all upset. What do you mean you can manipulate God into doing what you want? I said, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the case. And, and I was a college student at the time, and at that point, scared out of my wits, right? <laughs> but I simply turned to him and said, you know what? All I'm doing by saying I'll pray for you is I'm offering you the greatest thing that I have. God asks me to lift you up, your need up, before him. So if you let him take care of it. So it's not manipulation, it's a, this is the greatest thing that I have to be able to pray for you. And he said, his whole demeanor changed. Oh, okay. Okay. I get it. See, that's, we offer the greatest thing that we have. We don't push. We don't manipulate. We just say, here it is. Well, number four, get additional help. Get additional help. After the Samaritan applied first aid, he transported the victim to the local care facility so he could get additional help. You know, there are two things from that that we can learn in regards to blessing our community. And the first one is this. It does not and should not all fall on you. Get help. Get help. Don't do it alone. The Samaritan realized he needed help. Should you say yes when God opens the opportunity? Absolutely. But do not carry that entire load alone. God is not calling you to burn out for the kingdom. I don't know where that concept came from, but that's not God. He wants the best for your life. He wants to bless you. He wants you to get involved, 
but don't carry the whole thing. You know, it, it shouldn't be an either or. For some reason, we've got into this mode of e- either or. Either I do it all or I don't do it at all. No, no, no. That's not kingdom. That is a quick path to being overwhelmed, discouraged, resentful, defeated. Even if it started with good intentions. Which kind of leads to the second thing we could see about that, and that is that the neighbors need to see the body of Christ. They need to see the body of Christ. We display Jesus to our world most when we're working together. When we're doing it together. People need to know there are many believers who are willing to serve. Right? If, if Karen and I just go out and help the neighbors across the street, they're going to say, oh, nice people, great neighbors. But if the body of believers helps, they see Jesus. Because that's not happening in our world. People are always asking, what's in it for me before I get involved, right? So they need to see the body. Because it's not about you and me. It's about Jesus. It's about the body of Christ. When neighbors are blessed by the church, the body of Christ, they are impacted. They are intrigued. They are illuminated. And they begin to experience the love of Jesus. Healing must be understood as a team effort. The body of Christ is composed of many people, Scripture says, with different gifts, different abilities, who come together and are the hands and feet of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever worked on puzzles, right? But the next time you're working on a puzzle and a puzzle piece looks at you and says, sorry, if I can't do it alone, I'm not going to be a part of the picture. See how that works with that missing piece and that missing piece. It's a testimony to the world when we come together. People, all people, different walks of life, different experiences, united by Christ to make a difference. Well, finally, helping often requires sacrifice. Helping often requires sacrifice. The Samaritan sacrificed his time, energy, and finances to help the needy man. He took his own supplies, bandaged up the man, poured oil and wine on his wounds. He put the victim on his own animal and transported him to the nearest place where he could obtain additional care. And in addition to those immediate costs, he also paid the expenses for the extended care. Helping others requires sacrifice. And I've said it to you before, if, if I give Karen a gift that I found around the side, along the side of the road, right, cost me nothing, there's an idea. Mother's Day is coming up. is not meaningful at all, is it? Because it didn't cost. Those, as I started and talked to you about people that call the church and p- people online that say, you need to buy this, you need to do this, or, you know what? If you just send me a certain amount of money, right? I guarantee it'll bloom, right? I never do those things. First of all, because there's a lot of fraud online, but second of all, because I'm cheap, I don't want to invest my money, right? (laughs) But guess what? I don't get anything either. (laughs) Helping people requires sacrifice, because that's the demonstration of God's love. 
For God so loved the world that he sat there and said, I hope that they do okay. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. First, or John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for a friend. First John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And here's where John gets a little personal. He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love not with words or speech but with action and truth. Let's love with action. Loving our community with the love of Jesus, will mean sacrifice. It will cost time, energy, money, resources. If you're waiting for an opportunity to bless our community that doesn't cost you, it's not going to come along. We're blessed to be a blessing, right? It costs if you're waiting for an opportunity that's not going to inconvenience you or take you out of your comfort zone, then you're looking for a love that's devoid of action. Right? Devoid of service. Says Mother Teresa, love cannot remain by itself. It has no meaning. Love has to be put into action, and that action is service. That action is service. Now, yes, there are limits to the amount we can sacrifice. God is not calling us to neglect our families or burn out for Jesus. The Samaritan, I want you to know in the story, the Samaritan took the man, he, he bandaged his wounds, he put him on his horse, he took him to the inn. He even paid the innkeeper. And, but then he said, I must go now. Right? So yeah, there are limitations. The Samaritan did act, but he also passed the care on to others. Right? Took care of his own obligations. God gives us a brain so we can think, so we can have wisdom, right? So the Samaritan had skin in the game. Because of this, Jesus commended the Samaritan, and he said to him, go and do likewise. He said to all the disciples, all those listening, it's your turn. We are called by Jesus to put skin in into the game. Nice thoughts are nice, but they don't make a difference. And they don't love. We need to get involved. Jesus set the example by putting his own skin in the game on the cross, right? Gave his life so that we might be saved. In the words of Jesus, then, here, and in the words of the phone, here is, <laughs> go and do likewise. Go and do. And you know what's cool about that statement? Jesus didn't say, this is exactly what I want you to do. He, he leaves it wide open for us. He just says, but, but go and do. Go and do. Next week, in your bulletins, there'll be a little card. And that card is just going to ask you for your uh, opinion. Not your opinion about the church. Not your opinion about my sermons. 
although I know I would get glowing results. <laughs> but it's going to ask you, how can we bless our community? And I just, I just want you to dream. I want you to come up with ideas. And by the way, those ideas don't have to be, they can be, but they don't have to be brand new. Maybe you know of a, something that's happening, like uh, the food pantry that needing help, right? Maybe it's something that's already going on and you say, I think we should plug in there. Maybe it's something brand new, but how can we bless our community? Because it would be an absolute shame for us to go through this series and then do nothing, right? We want to bless. Can we do it all? No, we can't. But we can do something. So you'll be thinking about that this week. You'll be praying about that this week. And next week, there'll be a little card in your, in your bulletin as we kind of figure out how can we bless our community? How can we just love our community, right? And be Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your example for God, you loved us so much that you gave your one and only son. And I pray, Lord, that we would go and do likewise. We would touch and minister to people. God, I pray a blessing upon each one here this morning. I pray that you would encourage and minister to them. And Lord, May we truly be the hands and feet of Jesus, I ask. Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget about those of you who are members to come vote. And have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.